Hello, and welcome to another edition of Proficio Cyber Chats. On today's chat, we would like to welcome Ben Carr, Chief Information Security Officer for Qualys, and Zane West, VP of Products and Development for Proficio. On today's episode, our guests are going to be discussing how organizations are handling large volumes of vulnerabilities, how companies are setting up hybrid workforces, and some tips on staying compliant within your industry. Let's chat. Organizations struggling with a large volume of vulnerabilities are turning to risk-based vulnerability management for a more methodical solution to the problem. What is RBVM and how does it help organizations stay protected? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, we've been doing vulnerability management for a long time in the industry, and you, you would think it's kind of one of the most well understood uh, pieces of the, the cybersecurity puzzle, but I, I think people are struggling and have struggled for quite a long time with how to get value out of vulnerability management. I think, you know, adding risk base to it, um, again, you would you would think intuitively that would make it a little more uh, easy to understand and easy to consume. Uh-huh. But I think sometimes the complexity there is, you know, what is risk based and, and how do we apply that? And so, um, you know, it, it, it's it's essentially an evolution, looking at just the criticality of a vulnerability or the importance of um, a new exposure on a on an asset, and kind of matching that up with what is the risk to the organization of that vulnerability on that specific asset in the enterprise, right? So you could easily think of a, a specific vulnerability on a web-facing external application, and that same vulnerability on a system that sits in a lab environment. And the risks that those provide to the enterprise are much different. That's really the big meat of what people are trying to get to and answer as a question is, you know, everybody's trying to answer as opposed to what are the stats, the numbers, what are the, what's the technical of the security question? It's more what's the business application of the question and how does that relate essentially to that, you know, that individual vulnerability or that security issue. And so approaching it from a risk standard hopefully helps one translate that into prioritization. Uh, for remediation, but also for the business to actually understand, you know, what's the important of this thing these technical guys are bringing to the, you know, to the to the party as a discussion topic. Yeah, so I, I would agree there. I mean, I think that the a lot of organizations are really struggling with it. It's, it's just an unsurmountable amount of stuff that they have to do. And and you know, some of the biggest things that we see from our clients is is that they're, you know, not necessarily the biggest client in the world, but they still have, you know, 20,000 vulnerabilities that they have to remediate or something along those lines. And it's, and it's a, there's just too much to bite off at once and not understanding how that, that information relates to them as an organization. Um, I think that, you know, something that we've, we've tried to, you know, take an approach to is, is that stop thinking about it as we're not doing patch management. We're not doing, uh, you know, it's not necessarily vulnerability management, but it's risk mitigation within your organization. It also ties into um, what you see a lot in, in the organizations where they've got legacy applications that can't run on the new operating systems. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're outdated, they're unsupported, they're, that sort of thing. And then, but they haven't put the necessary other controls around it. And I think that that's another element of, you know, vulnerability management that has, is, um, you know, not necessarily well addressed is that you know risk based is is about how do i how do i manage my risk and, and that doesn't necessarily mean how do i patch my assets it means yeah. that you know there are always going to be these things if you think about the the introduction of ot into your uh, your traditional it environments where they typically were serial these serial based things that never ip addresses where they've now got these bolt on things like this those are also assets that have to be managed but you have to contain them in a manner that allows you to be able to protect them because you know that those uh, um, th- those things driving the construction or the manufacturing environments, whatever, are not necessarily going to be able to, you know, those things don't get powered off every tw- uh, f- for 20 years. Forget about patched and updated. Yeah, their maintenance window could be 18 months, right? And the life yeah. cycle could be 10, 15, 20 years. So it's it's not it's not an environment where you're going to be able to patch. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think <laughs> that that knowing, understanding how you can contain those assets, but you have to know what's there. Um, and understanding what's what's there, what's in your environment, where is it, who's the owner, and then what are the remediation controls that we have around those particular assets if there's something new that comes along. You know, sometimes it's just turn on an IDS signature um, or an IPS signature that protects you against that particular thing. Why is it important to look at risk-based, uh, you know, scoring as opposed to just taking kind of this base criticality score or the importance of the vulnerability out of it? 
like for me, it all boils down to, again, that that resource allocation, right? And trying to be a partner with operations and not just throwing a, a, lot, of, a lot of stuff over the fence. I, in, in an operational capacity, I've seen in the past where it's just, you know, it, it's, it's data, it's asking people to do things without regard for the other things that they're balancing on their plate. And so I think it, it breeds a lot of cooperation between teams when you really start to focus on this. It gives you a better seat at the table as a CISO, right? Um, as a security team to be able to have that conversation and say, look, we're trying to balance this just like the other risks you're trying to, we're trying to balance in the organization, whether we open up a new office or whether we you know, participate in a, in a new business venture, whether, how we remediate and how much we address in a time and what we address, that's, that's just as important as those other discussions. So, you know, the VM tools, they will just generate a ton of data. And I think this is, this is how you get a handle on that is really implementing a, a, a good, repeatable, consistent risk-based scoring. And ultimately, at the end of the day, for me, hygiene has the biggest impact from a security perspective on you know reducing the risk to the organization. And so figuring out how to how to effectively prioritize and remediate is really, really important. Many companies have transitioned to hybrid workforces, supporting both remote and in-office employees. What do you think is the best way to do this and what tools are essential for successful transition? It's kind of gone full circle now where, you know, going back 15, 20 years, the uh, um, security was all about the endpoints and the antivirus that you had on your machine, and then it shifted all back. And well, you know, it's, uh, it's those you know centralized will check you, uh, protect your critical assets in the data center. And now it seems to have now gone shifted out again. So yes, the critical assets in the data center are important, but that's all now in cloud. And uh, you know, but uh, now we've got the endpoints that are our main point of exposure again, uh, and that's where they we're getting compromised, and, and time and time again, because you know, phishing a- phishing attacks are still one of the, the highest. Uh, um, I, highest, you know, attack vectors that is that is being used. So, um, you know, having endpoint agents that give you the same level of protection and containment that you would have had if you were inside an environment, using VPN connectivity, allowing them to be able to access multi-factor authentication to get onto anything, um, pretty much, as well as then, you know, how do I now, uh, you know, check for vulnerabilities on those machines and then push out the the right patches on a regular basis has been a been a factor, and that's been a big target and focus. So EDR technologies, uh, the uh, um, agent, agent-based, agent a multifunction agent as well. So, so that you're not having these, you know, now I have 10 technologies running on my machine because each one of them does something point and something specific has been quite, quite a key thing over here and now. And I think our organizations are now quickly catching up. Um, but I think that also the, uh, the technology companies are realizing that, you know, having a, a technology stack that is able to do more uh, and provide them a, a broader spectrum of security services, including the patching and the vulnerability detection and um, the EDR containment searches, investigations, things like that is, has been quite important. Companies that that learn to do this remote working well, I think will find you know, great shifts in their business from their ability to execute and you know, take advantage quickly of opportunities, as well as reduction in costs, reduction in spend. And and I really look at this from security as kind of an opportunity for CISOs to to participate further and get that seat at the table that they've always wanted to get in the past. I mean, we we've struggled sometimes in trying to find how to make ourselves relevant. And this remote work environment, if if you're not taking advantage of this and making yourself relevant at the executive and the board level, then you're missing out on an opportunity, right? Um, it, it's just been such an opportunity for people to say. You know, we can do this securely. We can we can provide a way in which to work remotely that doesn't put additional risk to the business. And so, this is really an area where I think we're going to see acceleration um, on the security side. I think we've already seen it in some areas. I think you know, making sure that you're resilient, you're moving to two-factor authentication, you're making sure that you know you have remote accessibility, I and mean, it only enhances the need for the cloud. These are all things with that really from a security perspective are great opportunities to to excel in. Um, and, and I think you mentioned that pendulum swift or shift, right? I mean, it, it's, you know, that uh, mass computing out to individual endpoints back to mass computing. And I think right now we're seeing that definitely the enablement is on the endpoint. And as a result, it takes remote agents to actually be able to do much of this work, right? To be able to have that insight and visibility you, you can't depend upon gateway technologies. You can't depend upon things being blocked at a perimeter. The perimeter, we've been saying it's been going away for a long time. 
I think it's no, it's just no longer there. I mean, it's yeah. gone. The perimeter doesn't exist. Yeah. And even when people shift back into that office environment at some level, you know, I think there's still going to be that dependence on flexibility in that environment. And the, the the perimeter really is just gone. And so that perimeter is every endpoint. And so the quicker you can deploy new technology, the quicker you can get visibility about what's going on in the endpoint, the better that analysts can react to things. Yeah, I think an important thing for for organizations to consider when when now trying to evolve into this next technology and this next thing is is that uh, this next phase of how they work um, is that when evaluating technologies, also really really think long and hard about you know buying point point solutions. There is there is a difficulty in management. Uh, there is a you know impact on resources and network and infrastructure. And then you know something else that is you know is quite a common thing across the uh, the industry is is that as you buy these multifunction technologies or these individual point solutions, they're overlapping functionality that you're not taking advantage of. And then generally, it's it's far less effective to have two technologies, um, one each best of breed, than have properly leveraged and integrated functionality on a single technology that might be slightly weaker in one of the areas. And stay away from that buying that new shiny box, uh, which is which is that next best thing in that one particular space. But it doesn't play well with anything else. You know, you are going to you, you are going to find that there there is a, a a significant increase in the the overall risk to you as an organization by taking that approach. Um, so it's a you know consolidate, rationalize, simplify the management, um, and 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 focus on the 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 bigger picture outcome rather than the individual point solutions. Yeah, and I think you, uh, it, it touches back on that previous uh, question that we talked about hygiene a little bit, right? And you know, one of the most things is making sure that you've got the hygiene really locked down and really tight. And so you need that visibility in the endpoint. You need, as you said, kind of consolidation. And I think you know, if you look at you know two different solutions um, and you look at something that's you know truly uh, integrated in a single platform. That platform approach, you know, if you can meet the 90% use case, the 80% use case, I think a lot of times it's it's really enough for most organizations, right? It's a it's a stretch and it's a it's a maturity model to really even take in that much feature um, set in a in a product. And so as you do that, you also have to think about, you know, if you're if you're implementing three, four, five different products and trying to tie those together with different vendors, what's that integration look like and what's that effort look like? And so I, I think that's been one of the things that I've seen a lot of companies right now struggling with is, is how to tie those solutions together effectively, especially in this remote environment and how to get that that information to come back to analytics. Yeah, I think, I think that this this thing comes into, you know, how do you, you know, managing the resources and, and is it better for a company to take this kind of thing in, in house? Um, or, or to look at a partner who's going to have those skill sets. And I think that, you know, part of, you know, going back to there is there's a diverse set of technologies. There is a set of skills and capabilities. You, you've often found that, you know, in, especially with COVID-19 now that we've found that, you know, companies are cutting costs and with that they're mm -hmm. cutting resources and, and technical resources as, as such. And I think that there is a, um, you know, with that comes dilution of the skill set. They've maybe got a guy who's good enough on uh, various technologies, but they no longer have that special specialist um, that understands their 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 organization and their context, but they don't necessarily have the skills and capabilities to effectively use the tools and technologies. And uh, you know, and these these resources are there and out there and available, but it's it's more effectively with the in effective utilization and skills capabilities, bridging the skill gap to be able to. You know, potentially look at a partner or a um, a resource that you know an organization that's going to be able to you know help them more effectively manage and monitor their their environment. Yeah, and I, I in my experience, it's it's only the very very large enterprises that can really afford to put the, the the full team necessary, right? And even those enterprises, a lot of times, will will leverage or utilize external assistance, right? Third parties to provide very specialized resources um, when they need it. And I, I think, you know, for the, the small, mid or, you know, for, for companies that haven't really looked and figured out exactly what it takes to run a 24 by 7 SOC, right? I mean, the, the resource allocation is really, really high and that's an expensive proposition. And so uh, I've leveraged in, in my previous lives, I've, I've leveraged uh, external third parties to be able to provide some of those resources where I, I just didn't want to have the internal reliance on staff. And if we look at you know the the cyber shortage for talent it, it's only getting worse and so 
I think, you know, you're competing, you know, if, 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 if you're not a, a Google, a Microsoft, uh, you know, a PayPal, an Amazon, you, you're competing against those guys to hire those very precious resources. And so if you can leverage what a third party can provide and leverage that across, you know, the, the multitude of companies they're offering services to, I think quite often you get um, kind of better value for your dollar and what you're spending. Meeting compliance requirements is often a necessary part of the job, but most CISOs don't have the time to focus on it. What tips can you give organizations to help them stay compliant in their day to day? Yeah, so compliance is really interesting. When I when I think about compliance, I think there are a lot of organizations that I've had experience with in the past or I've interacted with that they really approach security from kind of like we have these compliance guidelines that we must meet. And so they that results in security objectives that we have to adhere to. And and I like to think about it a, a little bit differently. I like to approach it from the side of you know, we need to be secure because there's a certain amount of risk tolerance that the business wants to undertake from a technical perspective. And that's, you know, that's security. And so in that security controls environment, we need to have security policy. We need to have security compliance. We need to have our security program and our methodology down. And if we're approaching it that way, like that really should address like the compliance requirements that go along with whatever that that industry or line of business is. So if you think about it from a retail perspective, if you're doing business in a um, industry that's regulated by PCI, for example, if we're doing security right for that retail industry, like we should be crossing over the PCI threshold should be like just stepping over the you know the limbo stick. It, it shouldn't require really any effort um, from us at all. Uh, it's it's where you approach it from the compliance side, and that's your minimum benchmark and your minimum adherence. That typically you find yourself having problems from a security perspective and not doing the things that you know you should have done. I think that it's it's seen as this this giant thing in the room that we have to achieve and a chore. And I think that to, to your point, is it's about documenting the process, understanding where you are as an organization, and understanding where you want to be. Um, and I think in 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 every single one of those, uh, you know, the the compliance regulatory requ compliance uh, requirements is is that it's kind of moving towards a, you know, you know, understand your journey and 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 work towards something and and have a clear plan around, you know, one, two, three years in terms of how you're going to mature and 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 improve on certain areas. You know, it's the small incremental improvements that help you drive towards your uh, your compliance requirements. You know, so you know a lot of these, uh, you know, you know PCI or HIPAA or any of them that they have some base level controls that they're looking for, and that that they have to have. But it's just often they're just more common sense. Um, there's some supporting documentation that goes along with those. And so to your point is if you're if you're actually just following a good best practice, you know, pick up something like a, a NIST or the CIS framework or something along those lines, and don't necessarily get aimed towards a PCI you'll find that it's actually really, really easy to, to actually cross that bridge and go over into that, you know, being able to answer all the questions and meet those compliance requirements. If you're measuring risk on a, on a one to five scale in a capability maturity model, you know, a Bank of America or, you know, Citibank or, you know, a, fi a financial or federal government may say that they want to be a four and a half, right, on, on most everything they do. Achieving that's going to be really costly and really hard and take a lot of time. Um, most other organizations, you know, most, most businesses aren't going to say that they want to be a four or they want to be a four and a half. They're going to say, you know, I, I want to be a three or I want to be a three and a half. But recognizing that you're only at a one or a one and a half right now and what's the journey and the plan for how you get in each one of those areas from the score, from the, from the maturity you are now to where you're going and having that documented plan and adhering to the steps and, you know, making sure you're, you're matching that when the auditors come in. That, that's usually much more than they expect. I mean, it, it's it's just being able to document your process and understand where you are and have that communicated to management. Often, where I see um, organizations fail is is that that they try to in an area that's not necessarily their expertise cool. try Competency. to define you know define what that you know what their ultimate maturity you know status should look like. Um, in in context of a particular governance or risk uh, risk framework or something like that, and and yep. it's and it's you you probably need a consulting organization to who's going to walk you through and assist you through that journey and ask you all the right questions and help you define where where it is that you want to be and then get into that assessment. Okay, so now how do you match up to uh, to that to that process and and then once again help them you know 
help somebody to help you, you know, kind of walk you through their journey. And often along the way, there might be some, you know, smaller contractors or or other groups that you're going to be leveraging to be able to help with things, you know, technical skills or redesign a certain elements because it doesn't meet certain things or whatever it is. But you take it along those way, uh, along that way. I think that during that journey and and working with a consultant, it's probably going to help you have a better understanding and a better grasp over what it is that you're you're trying to achieve. And I think your your perception is going to evolve and change over time over the you know over the time and you'll, you'll have a better understanding of what it means to you as an organization um so and, and then and then allows you to factor more and more in and be more realistic about what it is that you're trying to do yeah no i agree with that 100 percent. so I, I i found that everyone's an expert in their field until they go to work for the company that they work for and then nobody internally thinks they're an expert in their field anymore right <laughs> um so the, the advice you often give internally is taken uh, you know, with a certain uh, set of lenses on it. And so I, I found it really helpful when you're trying to get, I think, two things. One, what's the maturity that you want to be at? What's the target that you're going for? And what's the realistic time frame to get there? Also, what's the, what's the current status of where you are in your maturity journey? Both of those benchmarks really are best served by getting a third-party external view for that. I'm a, I'm a big fan of outsourcing things that are either uh, commodities or you're not really good at yourself, right? And you can't build up that function, right? And it, if it's gonna be extremely costly, take you a long time and you can't get there from here, then, then outsourcing might be, might be the way you wanna go. We would like to thank Ben Carr and Zane West for joining us on today's episode. If you have any questions or comments related to any of the topics discussed today, please feel free to reach out to us at proficio.com or in Spanish at proficio.es. Thank you again for joining us and hope to see you at the next episode of Proficio Cyber Chats.